The next step in Rhodes' master plan was to expand British territory northward into those regions David Livingstone had explored years before. But across his route lay the empire of the Matabili, the people of the Long Shields, one of the most formidable warrior nations in Africa. Their king, Lobengula, known as the Eater of Men, maintained a reign of terror from his capital at Bulawayo, the place of slaughter. Gold had been discovered on his land and several European adventurers were after it. But Rhodes was after more than gold. He wanted Lobengula's country. The story of Rhodes and Lobengula is fascinating and it is foul. The two men never met and yet they had an extraordinarily strong relationship through intermediaries. Rhodes sent three of his agents to meet Lobengula, and in a bid to impress the Matabili king, he included among them the brother-in-law of the great David Livingston, John Moffat. But Lobengula was in no hurry to see them, and the men were forced to stay in an enclosure where the king kept his goats. There was a long, long wait for Rhodes' emissaries. Rudd particularly writes back about the appalling conditions, the mud, the flies, the stench, um, the impatience that they had there. They were kept waiting literally for months while Lobengula made up his mind. And finally, after all this waiting, Lobengula signified that he was willing to have a grand in Daba to discuss whether they would grant a concession to Rhodes' consortium. John Moffat presented Lobengula with a document that would grant Rhodes extraordinary powers. The complete and exclusive charge over all metals and minerals situated in my kingdom, principalities and dominions, together with full power to do all the things that they may deem necessary to win and procure the same. He eventually signed a document on the understanding that he was simply granting prospecting rights to Rhodes's company for his men to dig ten holes in his territory. Now, what Lobengula had signed, he had virtually signed away his country. Armed with that document, Rhodes was able to go to London seeking a royal charter which would be Britain's endorsement of his rights to that territory. Rhodes was now famous. He was widely admired for his immense wealth and achievement. But many distrusted him as a man who would let nothing, not even the British government, stand in the way of his ambition. The Queen was curious about her overmighty subject. She invited Rhodes to stay at Windsor Castle. In 1890, when he eventually met Queen Victoria, he charmed her. There's a wonderful moment where uh, it's said that she said to him, is it true, Mr. Rhodes, that you're a woman hater? To which he replied, how can I possibly hate a sex to which your majesty belongs? Rhodes won the Queen's approval and a royal charter authorizing him to exploit King Lobengula's concession. It gave him legal rights to recruit a company police force and build forts throughout the region, the powers of an independent state. But Rhodes still needed to break the power of Lobengula. To achieve this, he called on his closest friend, Dr. Leander Starr Jamison, a gambler, an adventurer, and a ruthless opportunist. 
His chance came when Lobangula launched an attack on a weaker tribe in a dispute over cattle. Jamison sent a message to Rhodes. We have the excuse for a row over murdered women and children, and the getting of Matabili land would give us a tremendous lift in shares. Jamison recruited a force of 1,400 white mercenaries. Each man was promised 6,000 acres of Lobangula's land and 15 claims to prospect for gold. When Rhodes and Jamison between them decided that the time was ripe to take Matabili land, the key ingredient, the key weapon for them was the Maxim gun, the machine gun. Now this was a weapon that fired 60 bullets a second. This had never, never been used in battle before. And it's extraordinary that a company, a corporation, should possess the most top secret weapon, as it were, of the, that the British Army possessed. But Rhodes had Maxim guns. The Matabili were mainly armed with spears and clubs. The result was devastating. Rhodes' Maxim guns just cut through the advancing Matabili. Again and again and again. It was like scything grass. They didn't stand a chance. The losses were enormous, 3,000 on one day. Um, it was slaughter. Lobangula fled Bulawayo with his wives. A few days later, his abandoned ox cart was found with the king's body lying nearby. According to one of his followers, the great king of the Matabili had poisoned himself. John Moffat, who had persuaded Lobangula to sign the mining concession, was stricken by remorse. The king was a gentleman in his way and was foully sinned against. In November 1893, Dr. Jamison hoisted the company flag over Bulawayo. Rhodes now had personal control over a vast territory that was to be called Rhodesia. A few days later, he made his triumphant entry into Lobangula's former capital and congratulated his troops on their destruction of what he called a ruthless barbarism. John Moffat now had a complete change of heart. The great Rhodes is prancing around. Everyone here is bowing down and worshipping him as the wisest of men. The popular tide is with him. I suppose there will be a crash someday, and men will suddenly recollect that there is still such a thing as justice, even to niggers. Rhodes' reward was to be elected the Prime Minister of Cape Colony. He bought a house on the slopes of Table Mountain overlooking the two oceans the Indian and the Atlantic. Here he surrounded himself with his male friends and enlightened them with his religious and racial theories. Whites have clearly come out on top in this struggle for existence. Within the white race, the English-speaking man has proved himself to be the most likely instrument of the divine plan to spread justice, liberty and peace over the widest possible area of the planet. Therefore, I shall devote the rest of my life to God's purpose and help him to make the world English. Rhodes was master of all he surveyed, but he wanted more. His lust for power would soon plunge Victoria's empire into its darkest hour. In 1886, gold was discovered in the Transvaal a state established by some of the Boers to escape British rule. Rhodes feared that the Transvaal Boers, enriched by revenues from gold mines, would become an obstacle to his plans. If they joined forces with German colonists in the West, they would block his route to the North. To avoid this, Rhodes formed an alliance with disgruntled miners in the gold town of Johannesburg and planned an uprising to overthrow the Boers. 
Jamison assured Rhodes, Anyone could take the Transvaal with a dozen revolvers. So Rhodes devised a plan to take the Transvaal by force. And these were the elements. That the people of Johannesburg would rise up in revolution. They would call for assistance, and Jamison would respond to that call with a group of mercenaries and Rhodesian police, and as it were, take the country. The promised uprising failed to materialize, but Jamison continued with the plan. He rode into the Transvaal at the head of his men. But the Boers were ready for them. They let the invaders ride on until they were surrounded and then picked them off with murderous accuracy. According to the Boer commander, many of Rhodes' raiders were boys in their late teens, and many were weeping. The Jamison raid into the Transvaal was widely regarded as an unprovoked attack on an independent state, a naked act of aggression. It sent shockwaves around the world. Rhodes was forced to resign as Prime Minister of Cape Colony, and he was summoned to London to answer to the British Parliament. But he had nothing to fear. Public opinion in Britain was increasingly anti-Boer. The Queen expressed the popular mood in a letter to her daughter. The Boers are a horrid people, cruel and overbearing. Rhodes had set Britain on a dangerous course. His violent and unscrupulous methods provoked a reaction that shook the empire to its core. And this at a time when the Queen was preparing to celebrate the glories and triumphs of her reign. Eighteen ninety seven was the year of Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, sixty years on the throne. Soldiers and colonial leaders from all over the empire came to London to take part in a spectacular parade. It was recorded by the new movie cameras. The little old woman under the umbrella now ruled over a fifth of the population of the planet. A never to be forgotten day. No one ever, I believe, has met with such an ovation as was given to me. The cheering was quite deafening, and every face seemed to be filled with real joy. But this joy would soon turn to disillusionment, as soldiers who had paraded the streets of London were sent to fight a war in South Africa. The British dispatched an army to accomplish what Rhodes had failed to do, put an end to Boer independence. The Boer War began just a year after the Queen's Jubilee. Cameramen go out to the Boer War as well, and actually showing film back in the sort of fairground cinemas that were being established at the time, people could go along and, and watch a few flickering images of um, uh, lancers galloping across the veldt or whatever. It was very exciting. And you had another form of war reporting, it's often forgotten now, in which soldiers at the front used to write back home and say, you know, dear mum, and, and, and describe what's been happening, and the family would take this along to the local newspaper, which would publish it. The British believed the Boer War would be short and glorious, but the Boers were well armed. 